Hello viewers, this time we're diving deeper into the world of barrel vibrations. We will continue our series on the vibration of barrels and explore some special cases. Today's focus is on bimetallic barrels. Let's uncover one of the topics we did not open last time. We're discussing the concept of free barrel vibration. What exactly does it mean? We will dive into what defines a barrel as free in semi-automatic and automatic systems. Is a pen barrel necessarily a problem? We will explore the nuances of this. Specifically, we will examine if this concept applies to K-style rifles. Let's broadly talk about the idea of a free barrel and its implications. And if you missed or forgot, I previously discussed this in the first episode. You are invited to watch it again, the link is in the description. Additionally, we will address the risk associated with non-free barrels. What should you be aware of? We understand that barrels normally exhibit harmonic oscillations, which are predictable and repeatable from shot to shot. However, what happens if there's contact with something during For instance, shooting with the barrel resting on the surface? Or if a pebble lodges between the target butt and the barrel, creating unexpected contact? Such contact disrupts the barrel's free vibrations, leading to unintended and variable moments of contact. This results in a mixture of the barrel's natural oscillation and smaller, erratic parasitic oscillation. These added oscillations lead to unpredictability and consequently a loss in the desired stability and accuracy in shooting. Now let's discuss the presence or absence of all and its impact. We'll examine this using practical examples. Consider two common examples, machine guns and the M16 rifle. In these automatics, the barrel's contact with the gas exhaust system is crucial. This contact, especially at the rear attachment point and the point in the first third of the barrel where the foreign attaches is significant. But how risky is this contact in terms of barrel vibration? To answer this, let's explore an alternative example. Take the Dragunov rifle, where the peculiarity lies in its so-called conditionally floating fern, not designed for vibration reasons. Dragunov was addressing the problem of wood instability in rifle butts due to hygroscopicity, the swelling and drying of wood. To mitigate this, the fern was made slightly shorter and equipped with a V-shaped leaf spring at the back to compensate for wood movements. Thus, the contact is smoother, not rigid. However, issues of barrel vibration remain evident in high-speed shooting. What's unique in these systems is the presence of the side gas exhaust engine. We take a closer look at how this influences the barrel. For instance, consider the automatics we have like the M16. The dense contact with the barrel's gas exhaust system can have effects. Apart from the rear attachment point, there is another contact point in the first third of the barrel, where the fornet attaches. Why does this affect the barrel's vibration? To examine this, we'll look at a contrasting example. In the Dragunov rifle, floating foreign was created for reasons other than the vibration control, mainly addressing wood instability in butts. Dragunov's solution involved making the foreign a little shorter, and adding a V-shaped leaf spring to counteract wood's hygroscopicity. This design allowed for smoother contact and compensated for wood's swelling and shrinking. However, even with these modifications, the Dragunov rifle, built to sniper standards, still faces barrel vibration challenges. It's interesting to note that these uh, ranges are visible during high-speed shooting. In the Kalashnikov assault rifle, large gases enter the gas chamber, impacting the rifle's mechanics. These gases exert force in two opposite directions. On one, one side, they push against the bolt frame. The bolt frame, being quite inertial and heavy, varies in different systems weighing between 400 to 500 grams. We're not going to find details now, but this creates a significantly inertial system. On the other hand, gases press into the gas chamber, which starts to bend the barrel. During rapid firing, we can observe this effect a serious blow that pushes the barrel and causes it to vibrate. So regardless of how loosely the barrel is fitted, the most substantial impact occurs in this zone. 
Now, question arises about the MB-16 and its gas exhaust engine. What makes it distinct from the Kalashnikov system? In the Kalashnikov, the gas outlet has a diameter of 14 mm. Note this down if you wish. 14 mm. In contrast, the M16's gas enters a tube with a diameter slightly less than 3 mm, precisely 2.97 mm. For those interested, you can also note this down. The force we're discussing is directly related to the area. This difference in gas outlet size between the Kalashnikov and M16 significantly affects their respective mechanisms. Understanding these differences helps in grasping the unique dynamics of each rifle's barrel vibration. Each design has its specific way of channeling and utilizing the gas pressure within the rifle. As we explore these aspects, it becomes clear how these structural variations influence the firearm's performance. Continuing this exploration, we'll go deeper into the mechanical nuances of these iconic rifles. The force exerted in a rifle's mechanism is a product of area multiplied by pressure. So comparing the areas, the 2.97 mm and 14 mm in diameter, this results in a difference of more than 20 times, a significant variance from the standard 22 pack. Such differences create varying shock moments in a rifle's gas engine and its automatic system. In the Kalashnikov, as previously mentioned, the bolt frame is quite massive, causing stronger mutual repulsion. Conversely, in the M16, the gas block acts more like a shoulder, transmitting gases without much resistance. These gases are transmitted until they reach the bolt frame, where they then exert pressure. Inside the bolt frame, gases press against a larger diameter, ensuring the rifle's operation. However, this pressure is exerted along the axis, not between the gas block and bolt carriers in the Kalashnikov. In the M16, the bolt frame and bolt push relative to each other, aligned with the barrel. This alignment means that the system does not impact the barrel's vibration. This distinction is a crucial feature. Regardless of the modifications made around the rifle, even if you secure the rifle in a unique way and avoid touching the barrel, this effect remains. Therefore, discussions about a freely hanging barrel in KK and SVD airfields are quite conditional often in experimental models aimed at achieving high accuracy. These aspects are crucial to consider. Understanding his mechanics is key to grasping the expected performance and precision of these rifles. Each rifle's design intricately influences its accuracy and handling, especially in high-precision scenarios. Achieving precision in rifles is done in different ways, mainly through more precise manufacturing of all components. This precision impacts the vibrations which don't entirely disappear. I hope this clarifies the matter sufficiently. Additionally, I'd like to delve a bit more into this topic on this channel. I rarely boast, but I'll take a moment to share something, not bragging. But as an interesting point, you might find my solution to this problem noteworthy or have some comments. Recently, I developed the CONIF module, a modular rifle system. One of its key features was addressing the issue of barrel vibrations. Specifically, the gas block, which receives the greatest pressure in the gas valve system, was designed to hold the barrel in an unconventional way, especially in the chamber zone. This design allowed for extraordinary rigidity to these points, there reducing vibrations. As a result, the system becomes less sensitive to different types of ammunition. As we know, vibrations can be influenced by numerous factors like the seating of the bullet charge, but a more sensitive system can be problematic when using various cartridges. Precision shooters are aware of this. They either select specific cartridges for their rifles or manually adjust parameters. In the case of the Conib module, attaching the barrel only in the middle reduces oscillatory circuits making them more inertial and slower, and less sensitive to different types of ammunition. This innovation offers a significant improvement in terms of accuracy and adaptability of the rifle. Such advancements are crucial in the field of precision shooting, where even slight variations can impact performance. Therefore, the approach of reducing oscillations and increasing rigidity plays a pivotal role in rifle design. It's these subtle yet impactful changes that can enhance the overall shooting experience and accuracy. 
This methodical approach in rifle design leads to a more reliable and versatile firearm suitable for various shooting conditions. Continuing with this thought, let's explore further how these changes in design can affect the rifle's performance. To my surprise, real tests demonstrated that surprisingly, even with Tula cartridges, which are quite affordable, the rifle achieved minute of angle groups across Russia, which is impressive. Continuing this topic, there's another aspect worth sharing, particularly regarding manually loaded weapons. In our previous video, we discussed bankrest shooting and the preference for shorter barrels at 1 to 200 yards to minimize vibration. However, for long-range shooting like in F-Class or my long shots, long barrels are indispensable for achieving the maximum ballistic effect. To maximize bullet acceleration and transfer, the barrel length is crucial, despite the inherent vibration. So what can be done about the vibration in these longer barrels? One solution is the use of safe of periodic blocks or perot barrel dating blog idol which involves attaching the barrel not at the breech but in the middle, thus reducing vibrations. I hope this clarifies especially regarding automatic and semi-automatic systems. Let's now move on to the next question of the use of carbon in barrels. Historically, this concept originated from the aerospace and insulation industries. One of the first examples of using composite materials and carbon fiber was over 50 years ago, in the 1950s with the creation of the R-10 rifles by Eugene Stoner and Sullivan. They utilized aviation technology and the entire platform's DNA was built around it. Initially, the company investing in them was an aviation firm, which created a small division specifically for applying aviation technology to small arms materials. This decision marked a significant evolution in the use of advanced materials in firearm design. Such innovations not only improved performance, but also influenced the entire history of firearm development. This integration of aviation technology exemplifies the progressive nature of firearm engineering. It showcases how interdisciplinary approaches can lead to breakthroughs in different fields. Therefore, this small division's role was pivotal in introducing these innovative materials into the small arms industry. At that time, it may not have been obvious to everyone, but it was a significant leap forward. The revolution in transitioning from traditional rifles with wooden stocks and metal edging to a more advanced platform. This new era introduced the active use of aluminum, plastics, carbon, and fiber glaze in various parts of rifles, including the stocks, nations, and notably the barrels. Unfortunately, as often happens in competitive tenders and under the pressure of effective management, engineers were pushed to the point of making compromises in design. They overlightened and thinned the main barrel excessively. As a result, during professional tests, such barrels couldn't withstand the pressure and rupture. This failure was a significant blow to the reputation of the R-10 rifles at the time. It severely undermined trust in both the R-10 system and carbon barrels in general. Consequently, this entire approach was sidelined for a long time. As our friend often says, the flight attendant was buried. The topic resurfaced much later, only in 1995, when Christensen Arms decided. This ends in mind the trust in carbon barrels effectively halting their development for a considerable time. This topic, once buried, resurfaced much later, rejuvenated by a new perspective. It wasn't until 1995 that the company Christensen Arms, based in Utah, decided to revisit and implement these technologies in a new way. Christensen Arms, located in the desert like many firearms companies, brought a fresh approach to the industry. Their remote location, typical for many Osman manufacturers, was not their defining feature. Instead, what set them apart was their pioneering approach to firearm technology. They started with focus on utilizing advanced materials, different from the earlier attempts in the industry. Let's explore step by step why there was a distinctive feature in their use of carbon. They utilized carbon in the form of a fabric, similar to its use in yachts and cars. This fabric was wrapped around the barrel in layers and then impregnated with resin. In this good form, it became the final barrel. The use of carbon provided high rigidity, surpassing steel and offered incredible lightness, lighter than aluminum. But what was the problem? 
Carbon has unique oriented properties. On one hand, it exhibits excellent thermal conductivity along the fibers, acting almost like an insulator with near zero thermal conductivity across the fibers. This resulted in the carbon glued barrel having very low heat dissipation externally, causing the barrel to overheat internally. This led to a significant issue. When heated, the expansion coefficients of steel and carbon differ. If you shot long enough to warm up the barrel, the layers would shift relative to each other, losing contact and eventually tearing apart. This damage was akin to rendering the barrel as just an ordinary thin barrel, losing its enhanced properties. Such a situation effectively kills the barrel, undermining the benefits of the carbon wrapping. Thus, this innovation, while promising, faced a crucial challenge in terms of thermal management and material compatibility. It highlights the complexities involved in integrating new materials into firearm design. This led to a situation where you had a metal barrel with a carbon layer that didn't adhere properly and caused rattling. Moreover, this configuration didn't allow the barrel to cool down effectively, leading to various issues. In the early stages of development, many who encountered these barrels likely had a negative experience. However, an ideal application for these lightweight barrels was eventually found, specifically in the context of the mountainous regions of Utah. This area, part of the Rocky Mountains, is predominantly used for mountain hunting, where long-range shooting is common and a lighter rifle is advantageous. Such rifles, being lighter and designed for a few shots at 2, 3 or at most 5, were not used like machine guns with continuous firing. This doesn't mean the barrel's lifespan was only 5 shots, rather it's about the duration of continuous shooting. In such scenarios, these lightweight barrels proved to be quite beneficial for the hunter. In practice, this meant firing a couple of shots in succession. If the shot missed, there's no need to empty a magazine. This design allowed the barrel time to cool down between shots. This limitation defined the use of these rifles, shaping their specific role. Christensen arms stayed within this niche, not expanding beyond this particular use of carbon. Then came BSF barrels, who introduced a different approach to incorporating carbon. BSF barrels discontinued direct carbon fiber contact with the barrel, leaving a deliberate air gap. They used a carbon tube over the barrel, allowing space between them for an air gap. This design served to enhance rigidity and reduce vibration without direct contact. The carbon tube functioned like a reinforcement, adding instability to the barrel. For a related example, consider the Soviet BMP-2 infantry fighting vehicle. The BMP-2's long 30mm gun barrel exhibits significant vibration during firing due to its length. This example is particularly illustrative of how barrel length and design can affect vibration. Such vibrational issues are also evident in other other applications, like helicopter-mounted guns. Observing how these barrels perform under different conditions provides valuable insights. It demonstrates the importance of design choices and the effectiveness and handling of firearms. While the system is even less stable, there are still a lot of vibrations and their vibrations are even worse. Which way did the engineers go? The engineers don't really believe in magical power and there's something plus five roots. They solved the issue technically. They began to build a truss around this thin barrel that will create such rigidity that it will stretch essentially like metal bridges. Tears of rigidity are relatively light, but at the same time much stiffer, and the larger the diameter, the larger the shoulder on which the support beams will be located, the more rigid the system. The company Bisset fought on the same principle, that is, carbon simply serves as a truss and for the best cooling, they even made additional holes in the carbon so that the heat could escape. What is the disadvantage? In my opinion, this concept actually has about the same disadvantage. The same as for the cooking machine guns that we have mentioned more than once on the channel. As soon as we have some kind of pipe or conditionally some kind of structure enclosing the barrel, any dirt getting into it, pebble or something else, somehow getting them out of there becomes an insurmountable problem. That is, you need to completely disassemble the system into trash in order to rinse everything clean well. But that is, this is a very serious problem. Therefore, from this point of view, the solution is interesting, but in my opinion, with a number of limitations. Well, again, this development didn't didn't stop there. Let's move on. Let's see who was next. On the American market, around 2012, a company named Proof Research made its appearance, utilizing carbon in their barrel designs, but in a different way. 
They started trapping carbon around the barrel, similar to the technique used on fishing rods, applying many layers back and forth to create a robust structure. This method allowed them to play with the fiber directions in various ways. And today, Proof Research is regarded as one of the top companies in this market. On a personal note, my team and I also ventured into carbon barrels, a bit later than Proof Research. We've had some successes and are now focusing more on the space industry, which has greater financial resources. This shift means Proof Research has somewhat stepped back from the shooting market, which, to be honest, is something we are quite pleased about. However, we don't rest on our laurels. We did a lot of research on heat transfer and found some solutions. In general, they say that it was emerged proof of professional research that I became interested in returning to this area. As you remember, I said that after Christensen Arms, I had a rather negative and skeptical attitude, thinking carbon in barrels was Mr. Fed. This skepticism lasted for about a year, if I remember correctly. Then around 2010 to 19, at a shooting range, I met someone with an Air 15 equipped with a short carbon barrel. I asked, why carbon? Are you just following a trend? It seemed somewhat gimmicky to me at the time. He laughed and said, I know what you mean, but there's been a real change in carbon barrel technology. He explained that these barrels now allow for extended shooting due to improved fiber materials. The resins used for bonding had also evolved, leading to better heat transfer. He pointed out that these barrels aren't used on machine guns, but are quite effective on carbines, especially when the shooter is disciplined and maintains a consistent shooting rhythm. This piqued my interest. It was clear that carbon barrel technology had undergone a significant revolution. I left that conversation with a new perspective on carbon barrels in modern firearms. While I can't divorce the specifics of how we are applying these advancements, I probably don't have the right to reveal secrets that is how we achieve it, but I can share the results with you. I can say that the results we've achieved with carbon barrels are quite remarkable. This encounter changed my view on how carbon can be innovatively used in barrel manufacturing. It demonstrated that, with the right approach, carbon barrels can offer superior performance. And that's what we're striving for, utilizing these advancements to push the boundaries in firearm technology. If anyone is interested in the results of our tests on this topic, I recommend looking at our test methodology. It's quite straightforward and, in my opinion, quite insightful. What we did was load a magazine with 30 rounds and fire them at intervals of one shot every 5 seconds. This shooting pattern is somewhat similar to a pseudo-marketing regime. We got the parallel tests with two types of barrels. One a pure steel classic M4 barrel and the other a carbon fiber barrel using the same cartridges. We chose not to use high-precision cartridges, but standard M855 rounds, as our focus was not solely on accuracy. The main goal was to assess the heating parameter, so we fired 30 rounds with a 5-second interval between each shot. We monitored how the dispersion changed, both horizontally along the x-axis and vertically along the y-axis. Additionally, we measured the cumulative dispersion growth with each shot, observing how it progressed after 2, 3, 5 and 10 shots. This allowed us to determine whether the steel or carbon barrel exhibited quicker dispersion growth. Another key aspect we measured was the temperature of the barrel after each series of shots. This helped us to understand which material, steel or carbon, heated up more quickly under sustained firing. These results provided important insights into the thermal characteristics and performance of steel versus carbon barrels. To determine which barrel would experience faster growth in dispersion and crucially, to identify the critical point at which we must cease firing declare that the carbon barrel can't shoot further. We closely monitored the tests. Our hypothesis was that the carbon barrel would reach a point where continued shooting would lead to excessive overheating. And now, attention to drum roll results. According to our test results, the carbon barrel showed less dispersion, which was actually expected. This is one of the reasons we use carbon. It has a high level of hardness. Additionally, when it comes to the rate of dispersion increase, as measured the wisest, carbon grows slower than steel. I want to clarify that I'm referring to our specific carbon barrels, not all carbon barrels worldwide. The most intriguing aspect for me is related to the temperature measurements we conducted. We measured the barrel's temperature at three key points. 
The first point is between the chamber and the gas block. The second is at the gas block. And the third at the final interval between the gas block and the muzzle. The diameter is smaller at this third point, which was important for our measurement setup. So in both steel and carbon barrels, we measured at these three points. The outcome showed that carbon barrels heat up less. Now, a good engineer should always maintain a healthy level of skepticism. A critical engineer might say, of course, the external temperature of the carbon barrel is lower because the carbon fiber acts as an insulator, retaining heat internally. So, how do we verify this? By measuring the temperature in areas where the barrel is bare metal, this way, we can truly assess the internal heat of the barrel. I measure the barrel's temperature in two key areas. On average, and specifically in the gas block zone, where the barrel is exposed and not covered by anything, essentially where there is bare metal. In this area, we found that carbon also heats up more slowly. Why? Because as I mentioned earlier, carbon has a unique property. It transfers heat much faster in the longitudinal direction compared to steel. This means that with the right design, a carbon barrel can be made to transfer heat more efficiently, allowing it to cool down quicker and heat up less. Here's a little secret, a little trick if you will, about carbon barrels. I'll probably end the discussion here because music, I believe that the development of carbon barrels didn't just stop there. It's still ongoing. We're not only reducing weight, but also, surprisingly, we're improving accuracy. Now, I'd like to delve into another intriguing aspect. Not exactly a secret, but a unique area concerning light barrels and vibration. When we talk about composite materials, we're not referring solely to carbon. It's about the use of a combination of different materials. In this context, I might be slightly off about the year, but it was around 2010, more or less. Unfortunately, there are no clear records available from that period. Over the years, it just passed from my life, and only now have I started thinking about it. As I get older, I'm starting to think about history, trying to record something. At that time, in several countries simultaneously, there were attempts to work with the metallic barrels from the Lotte company. Walter, the renowned German barrel manufacturer, who specializes in making barrels for many European manufacturers who don't produce their own, they began experimenting with barrels consisting of a steel liner inside. The liner is the inner part of the barrel, the metal that holds the pressure and works with the rifling. And the outer part they made in the form of an aluminum jacket, putting it on as tightly as possible with all the precision of German engineering, thereby creating rigidity on one side and on the other hand, better heat transfer to the outside, because aluminum transmits heat better and dissipates it more effectively. The barrels were supposed to heat up less, but alas, the materials also have slightly different expansion coefficients, and as far as I know, they never managed to achieve stable results at the serial production level with this design. That is, the presence of some kind of internal gaps of incomplete contact led to the fact that the heat sensor turned out to be an airlock. But as an example is like air between glass and windows in winter. Why does a, a window retain heat? It's because there is air between the glasses, which acts as a bit of an insulator. In short, this bimetallic barrel concept didn't take off among the Germans. If you visit the Walter website now, I'm afraid you won't even find a mention of this project. They were removed, never fully realized. Meanwhile, other American companies pursued their own paths and experimented with different options, including designs with drains, similar to what the Americans call a sleeve. These sleeves on the barrels led to the same negative results. Despite this being quite tenacious, they went further. They began to apply aluminum to the barrels in a slightly different way, possibly in a plasma state. They applied it so that it really bonded tightly, creating an inextricable connection. Did it work? Yes, they managed to achieve a hard contact similar to spraying. But further, the project wasn't industrialized. Why? because the application procedure was quite expensive and the benefits didn't justify the costs. That's why this approach didn't continue. However, I believe that this technology hasn't died completely. It may well receive a rebirth if a cheaper way to achieve the same result is found. 
So if among my audience there are scientists and engineers who are close to this topic and are working on it, please consider this as a promising topic. It's worth engaging in as it may lead to breakthroughs in the future. This area of research, combining different materials for barrel construction, would revolutionize the way we think about and construct firearm barrels. For those invested in this field, it's an exciting and promising frontier to explore. As a small finishing element on the topic of aluminum usage on barrels, not just from a vibrational standpoint, but purely for thermal transfer, I need to touch on it to fully close this topic. I'd like to mention the company GP. They mainly produce sporting rifles. I haven't heard of them doing anything for the military, and as far as I know, they don't do much for hunting either, but are completely focused on sports. They introduced what they call an English and aluminum radiator that is mounted on a barrel, something similar to the aluminum radiators installed on computers on the processor to enhance cooling. They claim it works better than nothing, but it's not fantastic either, largely because it heavily depends on the quality of contact between the surfaces. It's a cheaper solution and you can always experiment with it. Foilia, welcome to this field. I think with this I'm closing this topic. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. Maybe I missed something. Please forgive me and comment. We can discuss this topic further. That's all for now.